Our introductory lesson for this seminar is entitled, The Problem with the Bible. The Problem with the Bible. We'll search a few of the problems to discover the big problem, which I've written on the board right behind me. The big problem is that every time we read the Bible, we're interpreting it. It's not necessarily a science and art that we use to interpret the Bible. The problem with the Bible is that it needs to be interpreted correctly because there are some, some problems with the Bible. The first problem that we'll mention is that the church is united around the Bible. Now, why is that a problem? Well, Christianity is eminently a religion of the book, as it's been called. The Bible is a centerpiece in the liturgy, the worship, the theology, uh, the lifestyle of all churches everywhere. Now, that's a problem, basically, because people are people. And it's people that interpret and read the Bible. The second problem that I'll mention is that not only is the church united around the Bible, but it's divided by the Bible. Now, why is that? Well, mainly because of the problem of self-deception and self-serving uses of the Bible. To promote an agenda, usually with the words, thus saith the Lord. People do what they want, and then they blame God. And I think it's because of the many divisions and even heresies, each with unique emphases and particular focuses, differences of opinion and interpretations, understandings and pre-understandings, theologies, pet convictions that people bring to the Bible when they read it. And I think the church is divided by the Bible because, well, meaning and readings that were important in one generation, they get sanctified but then mean very little, if anything, to the next generation. Makes no sense to subsequent generations. And all of this, I believe, is because of the third problem with the Bible that I'll mention, and I'll develop this particular problem in a little more detail. The next problem is that the Bible is multidimensional. Again, the Bible is multidimensional, and I'll mention about a half a dozen multidimensional facets of the Bible that lend itself to differing interpretations. Uh, first off, the scripture texts themselves naturally lend themselves to differing interpretation. So the texts within the Bible can have different interpretations. I mean, consider the fact that the Bible is divided into two sections, uh, two testaments or two covenants, if you will, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And both testaments, they're each written in, uh, in two different language traditions, the Hebrew scriptures, of the Old Testament, written in Hebrew, in a little bit of Aramaic. The Christian scriptures of the New Testament, written in Greek. And then between those two testaments, there is both continuity and discontinuity. There is unity that holds them together, and there's quite a bit of diversity. Now, the unity of the Bible is derived in the fact that it is the same God being revealed in his saving deeds. And his dealings with humanity and the world. The discontinuity is seen... For example, in the New Covenant, where God is described as love, with differences in characteristic emphases used to describe the same God uh, of the Old Testament. Some of the Bible existed as oral tradition, passed on by storytellers and singers, perhaps even troubadours, before they were ever literalized and scripturalized and then collected into the Bible. So the Bible is not one book, but it is many books. A compendium of 66 vastly different books composed by at least 40 authors spanning a time period of about 1,500 years. And it reflects many differing worldviews and religious ideas, even political ideologies. So the Bible is in two testaments. It's not one book, but it's many. A third multidimensional facet of the Bible is that, that we cannot always determine precisely what the Bible says. There are some matters of uncertainty I mean, no original autographs actually survive. The earliest Hebrew texts we have access to, the Dead Sea Scrolls, date back to just before the time of Christ. The Hebrew Bible that we do have, um, the uh, Masoretic text, was not edited into a fixed form until about 500 A.D. The Greek translation of the Old Testament, which we have studied in an earlier seminar, um, the Septuagint, or Septuagint, also called the LXX, so named because uh, supposedly 70 scholars spent exactly 70 days to bring this perfect translation into the Greek language. Um, 
that wasn't completed until about 150 BC, and there are differences between the two, between the LXX and the Septuagint. Most quotations of and references to the Old Testament texts in the New Testament are taken from the LXX, not the Hebrew text. Now consider the text of the New Testament. Scholars have access to about 5,000 different manuscript copies of the New Testament. Study of the manuscripts is called textual criticism, and we'll deal with that particular study of the Bible's text in a, a different seminar lecture. The textual criticism is important, but it is a challenging aspect of New Testament interpretation, and it's something that we must at least be familiar with in the interpretation of the New Testament. The manuscripts that we have uh, include 88 papyri manuscripts dating from the 2nd to the 4th centuries of the Common Era. We have 257 unseals, that's capital letters only. Those manuscripts date from the 4th through the 10th century. We have about 2,800 or so minuscule manuscripts. Those are small letters only from the 9th to the 15th centuries. We have 1,800 lectionaries. These are selections of scripture collected together for liturgical and devotional reading. Those date from the 8th and the 9th centuries. We have hundreds of New Testament manuscripts translated into several other languages, um, including Coptic, Syriac, and a few others. Uh, consider again the, uh, the language of the Old Testament and its difference from the language of the New Testament. The Hebrew alphabet had no, no vowels, and manuscripts had no spacing between words. Early Greek manuscripts had uh, no spacing, no punctuation, no capital letters, no chapter, no versination. They were often cross-written. And consider the uh, passing on of the manuscripts, the uh, script writing, for example. Now, the manuscripts were all handwritten. There were no printing presses. They were produced in scriptoriums under low lighting conditions. It's common to find scribal errors in the manuscripts. And the errors were passed down to the next copy to create text traditions that perpetuated the differences. Uh, another multifaceted aspect of the Bible itself is the facet of language itself. Uh, consider the fact that language changes over time. Note the differences in lang language from the time you were a, a young person up until now. All living languages are dynamic, undergoing constant change, requiring updated translation. Why, I think of some of the interesting language differences between the King James Bible and some of the more modern English translations that we have. I have a King James Bible that uh, I call it the Sinner's Bible because it says that uh, uh, they had intercourse one with another. So even the meaning of words changes over time. And translation is not an exact science. But there's a certain amount of interpretation, as I've said, that inevitably occurs with every translation. And theological points of view are interjected into the translation. And it's just good to be aware of the, the sort of theological bias and pre-understandings that a translation committee had when they were coming to the text. So, as I've said, every translation is an interpretation and every reading is an interpretation. But not only are scriptural texts lending themselves to different interpretation, let me turn the coin now and suggest that scriptural contexts lend themselves to differing interpretations. And I'll develop this point with some uh, length because it's important and will uh, open up a discussion for us later. The context. Consider that there are multiple tradition of the same events contained within the Bible. Creation, the flood, lives of the patriarchs, exodus from Egypt and conquest of the promised land, the history of Israel, the life of Christ, Accounts differ, sometimes sharply, between the different accounts contained within the Bible. I mean, consider the subtle differences between events recorded in First and Second Kings on one hand, and the same events recorded in First and Second Chronicles on the other hand. Or the subtle nuances between the four Gospels. Some of the events in the timeline are turned around a little bit between the synoptics and, and John. Sometimes even within in the synoptics there are differences. Or the New Testament's use of the Old Testament. Matthew chapter 21 verse 7 records Jesus riding into Jerusalem at the triumphal entry on two donkeys. Not one, but two. For it says, he sat on them. Plural. 
while the prophecy fulfilled in the triumphal entry, Zechariah's colt, even a foal, in Zechariah 9 9, that was originally envisioned as one animal. Secondly, there are different concepts of God. And again, we're talking about the contexts of Scripture and how they lend themselves to differing interpretation. Think of the concepts of God. The name of God is Yahweh, but there are many different epithets, descriptions, titles for God. Yahweh, El, Elohim, Adonai, Yahweh Sabaot, El Shaddai, El Elyon, El Roy, El Olam, uh, etc. And you can find this list in your outline, and I trust that you're following along in your in your lecture outline and taking notes. Um, there are different biblical views of God's nature and character, his personality, his will, his activities and dealings with humanity and the world throughout the Old Testament alone. Different Old Testament text traditions using different names for the God of Israel, they were brought together over time and integrated into the canon with these different multifaceted aspects of God's nature and character and divine attributes brought together, sometimes under the same book of the Bible. The understanding and doctrine of Yahweh as a cosmic, universal deity, rather than as a local, geographically contingent one, a god of the land, if you will, that was not accepted by the Jews until after the Persian period. And there seems to be dichotomous views of God, um, perhaps dialectical competing views of God that are held together in necessary tension. For example, is God nearby and close at hand? Is he imminent? Or is he transcendent, holy, and far off? Because we have a Psalm 22 God who seems so distant and worlds away, but with just a turn of the page we have a Psalm 23 God who is with me always to shepherd me and care for me. God is depicted elsewhere as a warrior deity, bloodthirsty and vengeful, jealous, even genocidal, judgmental and vindictive. Why, there are 600 violent acts recorded in the Old Testament committed by God, about 1,000 verses that attribute violence to God. God expressly commands his people to kill more than 100 times. Violence associated with God in the Old Testament is more common than worship of God in the Old Testament. And yet, elsewhere, God is merciful and compassionate. Are not his mercies new every morning? Great is his faithfulness. He's sending forgiveness even to enemies, consider Jonah and the Ninevites. He enjoins the nation Israel to participate in worldwide universal blessings and global salvation. Why, the God of the Old Testament, revealed in the Christ of the New Testament, would rather be afflicted, be hurt and destroyed, than to destroy, hurt, and afflict. The God revealed in the Christ on the cross would rather die than damn, and he did. And yet it is the same God depicted throughout. How do we interpret these multifaceted aspects of God and the multifaceted aspects of the Bible? We have different views of God's relationships between humans and the creation, with differing ideas of God's actions between the Old Testament and the New Testament, different understandings of salvation between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Old Testament is depicted as law, and salvation, or shalom, or wholeness and peace with God, is brought about by participation and faithfulness to the covenant community such as cultic observances, Sabbaths, new moons, festivals, sacrifices, offerings, dietary restrictions, even clothing that you wear. But it's observance of God's law that brings you into the right fellowship of the community and with God. In the New Testament, it's grace with a new sort of uh, Hellenistic perspective on the individual. Salvation comes by grace through faith, not by works, lest anyone should boast in the New Testament. And there are different moral and ethical systems operative at different times and in different places among different peoples depicted throughout the testaments, both old and new. Consider today, I have observed Catholics in worship and in the practice of their faith in Europe, and I have observed Catholics in worship and the practice of their faith in Latin America, and we have virtually two different religions. In one case, an emphasis on the tradition and the history and the liturgy is central in the life, faith, and practice. 
uh, on the other hand, it's a political ideology. And God is seen as having a preferential eye for the afflicted, for the poor, and for the downtrodden in uh, Latin American liberation theology. So even in the same time frame, we have two very different expressions of Christianity. Elsewhere in North American fundamentalism, I have met very well-meaning Christians who smoke and drink and go clubbing. <laughs> Yet they love to pray and worship in the church, and they study God's word together. Other Christians look at that kind of testimony, and they're appalled at the worldliness. But they would see card games and the taking of a paper on Sunday as evil in the Lord's sight. Because in today's age, we have Christians who would be happy to kill the enemy and to bomb bin Laden, while other Christians, perhaps attending the very same church, turn the other cheek and march in peace protests and participate in the Occupy movements that we see across the country. Why is that? The reason is because we have a problem with the Bible. Part of the problem is that we hear in this multifaceted Bible not one, but many different voices speaking in the Scriptures. And so the reader and the hearer and the interpreter of the Scriptures may hear different voices speaking to them from the same Scriptures. But not all of the voices speaking out of the Scriptures are holy. Why, we believe the Bible to be the Word of God, and yet it has to be interpreted by fallible humans. And yet the Bible, being the Word of God, contains words coming from people and things that are not God. Not all of the words in God's word are God's words. We hear the voice of prophets, both true and false. We hear Christ, but also the Antichrist. There are both women and men, rational and insane, speaking in the Bible. We hear the voice of God, Jesus, and angels. But then we hear the voice of Satan, demons, madmen, scoffers and mockers, fools. We hear humans and animals consider the serpent and the donkey speaking in Scripture. So not one voice, but many voices speaking in the Bible. And then there are a variety of literary styles found throughout the Scriptures. And we'll approach this in a deeper way in the lecture on form criticism. But there is both prose and poetry, and each must be read differently. You cannot take the same interpretive framework and apply that over poetry the same way you would apply it over prose and narrative. There is theological doctrine that sets forth timeless truths, but then there is liturgical and doxological praise hymns that certainly say more about the devotional and spiritual status of the worshiper than, than it really says about the God being exalted. So the form and genre of literature must be properly understood in order to realize the Bible's meaning and use. There is wisdom and proverb, prophecy, history, story and parable, songs, odes, hymns, even myths contained in the Bible. There is apocalyptic literature, and then there are letters. They cannot be understood using the same interpretive framework or listening with the exact same ear. They must be understood individually and on their own terms. There is drama. There are figurative symbols, such as allegory, metaphor, hyperbole, etc. And it's not always clear if a Bible text should be interpreted literally or figuratively. How can you know? Will rocks literally cry out with praise? Will mountains move with faith? Or do we understand that as spiritual mountains? Was the earth created in six literal days? Was there really a Garden of Eden, a global flood with a Noah and an ark and two of every kind of animal? Was there a million-man exodus that crossed the Red Sea on dry land and made a conquest of the Canaan land, of the Promised Land? Did the sun stand still? And why are there different interpretations of these unique and miraculous events recorded in the Bible? One more point of uh, the... Uh, multifaceted aspect of the Bible, then we'll take a short break. But the Bible describes not only what ought to be prescriptively, but also what was and is descriptively. We're not only told what to go out and do, but we're also given descriptions of the lives of other people, what they did right and wrong. And so not everything recorded in the Bible is praiseworthy, and we must be careful there. For example, the Bible says Judas went and hanged himself, 
and then with just a few turns of the page you can discover that it says go and do thou likewise now how do we string together different verses within the Bible to come up with a theology prescriptively something that we should go out and do the Bible does not say go and hang yourself like Judas and yet people use that same exact method to interpret their Bible and every reading is an interpretation So if it is reported in the Bible, it is not necessarily the model for us to pattern today. Consider Old Testament laws. Which ones are for today? And why? And we'll pick up on that after a ten-minute break.